Clear to Nashville last file. Maintain 5,000. Score point zero zero zero. The pressure control will be one two six point six. I was in the newsroom when I heard the first scanner traffic of some kind of incident going on at uh, the airport. It was a Tuesday night. I'm covering high school basketball at the stadium. And as I'm walking in, I'm told, hey, did you hear about the plane crash out at the airport? I think it was about 20 after 7, a bulletin came on and said uh, that there had been a plane crash in Evansville. I get a phone call. Pat, I just heard that uh, Evansville had a plane crash and the team may not be on that. And I said, no, they left at 3 o'clock. So I said, it wasn't our team, I'm sure. I said, no, it's not us because we had left earlier. But then again, we thought, well, maybe the weather had delayed the flight. I called and I couldn't get any answers at first. I don't even remember who I talked to or who or all I called. But I said, I have to know. I've got to know. And I told them who I was. And then I decided I'd call Bob Hudson's wife and ask if they got away OK. And I called her and she said, oh, honey, she said they didn't get away till just a little bit ago. And right then I knew. I get back to the station at about 8 o'clock. It was unusual that my boss, the GM, would be there that late. And he looks at me and he says, it was the Aces. And from that moment on, nothing would be the same. For the three decades leading up to 1977, the University of Evansville rose to national prominence as a powerhouse in the NCAA's college division, winning five national championships that included an undefeated run for the 1965 season. Led by coach Arad McCutcheon, who went on to become the first college division coach in the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, the Purple Aces won more than 500 games launched the careers of NBA stars like Don Boozy and Hall of Famer Jerry Sloan, and captured the hearts of fans across southwestern Indiana. I think Aces basketball is the University of Evansville's identity. So many people still know us today for the sleeves, and they know Jerry Sloan played there. The remarkable success when, when UE was playing in the college division, the five national championships, the coverage by Sports Illustrated, where Frank DeFord says, you have to go down and see what's going on down there in Evansville. I connect my childhood and growing up in Evansville with Evansville College and Arad McCutcheon and the orange uniforms. I was going to games since before I could remember. I'm told that I was present for all five Division II championships. I don't remember the first two because I was two and three years old, but I was there and they had pictures. It was the social event. You had to beat an Aces basketball game if, if not to watch it to be seen. We were in the top 10 in the nation, not in college division, in the nation attendance. The basketball program was an extension of the community. This was our basketball team. That's one of many reasons, but I think the reason why when the, you know, the terrible accident happened, it was, it just blew such a hole into the entire community. After more than 30 years coaching the Aces, Arad McCutcheon announced his retirement as head basketball coach in January of 1977. He walked away with five college division national championships, more than 500 wins, and a brand new car.
His retirement marked the end of an era in Aces basketball and came on the heels of the university's decision to take its program to the NCAA's highest level, Division I. It was a controversial move for a school that boasted fewer than 2,500 students, located in a city of barely 130,000 people, all of whom were used to winning big on the hardwood. We were going from being a big fish in a smaller pond, you know, to being a pretty small fish, a really small fish in the biggest pond of all. There were a lot of pessimistic people not being sure of how this move to Division I was going to be, especially without Arad McCutcheon being at the helm to make this transition. And then, of course, the announcement. Jerry Sloan. In case you joined us late, it is official. Jerry Sloan will become the new head basketball coach at the University of Evansville. It was a big day, big moment. I mean, having Jerry Sloan as our coach, Jerry had just been an all-star pro player, as well as being a legend in Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana. It was an electric press conference. Sloan comes in and people were just He's come back. That was a Thursday. Well, Sloan, after three and a half days, goes into Dr. Wallace Graves, the president, and says, I've made a mistake. I'm going to withdraw. We never really got an explanation of, of why that was. Well, you can talk to him about why he made the decision. I don't think he's ever really just come out and, and gave the public why he made the decision that he did. No, I haven't. I don't, I don't think that's fair to the Evansville people. Life goes on, that's the only thing I can say. Life goes on and I made mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes in coaching, made bad decisions and that's part of it. Once Sloan walked away from the job a week after taking it, uh, there was renewed despair, if I can use that term. The obvious thing that we had to do was get someone hired. A guy named Bobby Watson is brought into Evansville, blows the committee away. Here's this six, seven good looking guy that had been a head coach at junior college, had been at Xavier, Wake Forest, and it was at Oral Roberts at that time. I thought he was sort of an, like an evangelist. You were totally captured by what he wanted to do, what he thought he could do, and what he made you believe he could do. I mean, when, when he talked to him, they said, hey, this is it. We think we found our guy. I can remember Bobby and Deidre waiting for the phone call at the house, and we were all there. And when the phone call came, there were, you can't believe the excitement. He was just over the top. He loved basketball, and his dream was to be a head coach. First thing Bobby did was when he came in, he hired assistants, Ernie Simpson, who had been head coach at Union County High School. And then Mark Sandy came in, and he, Mark had played for him when he was at the Judy College. They hired Stafford Stevenson. When Bobby got the job, he called and he said, uh, I'm taking the job at Evansville, and I'd like for you to come and be my assistant. I came out, spent a weekend with Bobby, a little over. Uh, we drove around town, we met a lot of people. I mean, there was no question about it. This was gonna be a great job. With his coaching staff in place, Coach Watson shifted his focus to bringing another critical part of the team into the fold, the Evansville community. Bobby knew the, the history of Evansville and how important the city and athletic department relationship was. He made a concerted effort to make himself available to speak to any civic group. Oh, he was everywhere. He went out, he was at all the uh, all of the community clubs. There wasn't any time that you couldn't feel free as I did to ask him to go to the Rotary Club or to come, come do this. He was able to sell himself, his ideas, his enthusiasm, not only to the community, but also to a number of recruits because they did a fantastic job of recruiting some very, very talented players. Bobby, the U of E has several freshmen. What are your thoughts about the role of a freshman going into Division I basketball? I think here at our program, we have uh, freshmen who can contribute uh, this first year. Uh, I think on certain nights, they're going to play great. And people are going to say, well, what phenomenal talents. And boy, they're playing like sophomores. They're playing like juniors in college already. But then there's going to be other nights when they play like the senior in high school that they were a year ago. And then that's going to draw on the patience of myself and my staff and on the fans. Hi, I'm Craig Hackendorn from Cincinnati, Ohio, six foot two guard. Hi, I'm Mike Joyner. I'm from Terre Haute, Indiana. My high school was Terre Haute South. I'm a freshman at six foot three. I'm a guard. In my major, I intend to major in business. Hi, my name is Barney Lewis. I'm from Goldsville, North Carolina. I'm a 6'7 forward and I weigh 215 pounds. My major is industrial arts. 
and I think we'll have a great team this year. Hi, I'm Greg Smith. I'm a six-foot guard from West Frankfort, Illinois. Hi, my name is Mike Duff. I'm 6'7 forward from El Dorado, Illinois. My name is Ray Comandela. I'm a six-foot-eight forward from Munster, Indiana, and my major is mechanical engineering. My name is Warren Austin. I'm six four and a half guard from Goldsboro, North Carolina. My major is business, and my nickname is Silky. Hi, my name is Mark Siegel. I'm a freshman guard from Indianapolis Pike. I'm studying business accounting. Mark was a very outstanding player who played for me at Pike High School in Indianapolis. Bobby had recruited him for Oral Roberts University. I remember we were eating breakfast at the table and it was in Indianapolis Star that Bobby Watson had become the new head coach at the University of Evansville. And Mark laughed. He says, this might get interesting because he always liked Bobby. He got Segal from Pike High School. Mike Duff from Southern Illinois. Mike Duff, perhaps the jewel of that recruiting group, highly recruited, highly talented. He's someone you can build a team around and he lived up to the hype. Two of the kids uh, that we had signed uh, from Goldsboro, North Carolina, Warren Alston and Barney Lewis, Warren, a 6'4", second guard type player, smooth, silky, going to be a great player. Barney Lewis, a, a thicker, heavier set, 6'7", 215, 220, a, more of a physical person. He just had some really good young kids that were coming in. I really think that had that all been able to gel and put together, they would have had quite a basketball team. We did have a good group coming back. I think we had seven players back and we had some good ones. I had John Edward Washington, he went to Tech High School. He was a senior on that team, left-handed, uh, about a 6'4 guard. He was a leader. He didn't have maybe some of the talent to some of them, but he was the type of kid that the players respected. My name is John Edward Washington. I'm a 6'4 guard forward. Hi, my name is Kevin Kingston. I'm a 6'2 guard from Eldorado, Illinois. My name is Tony Winburn from Jeffersonville, Indiana. Went to Jeffersonville High School, guard 5'8", 150. Tony was a live wire. He was in perpetual motion on the court and off. On the court, uh, when he would get the basketball, he was just a blur. And somebody like a Keith Moon, just prince of a fellow. I'm Keith Moon. I'm a 6'8 center from Kettering, Ohio. I'm majoring in PE, and my fellow teammates call me the bird. This is Steve Miller. I'm from New Albany, Indiana. I'm 6'9". I'm the only married basketball player here at U of E, and I'm majoring in production management. Steve Miller, of course, was my age as well. Steve was not a big, bulky kid. He was sort of a slender post player, and we didn't have a lot of size on that team. If there was one area that we were a little concerned with was the size. Steve had good skills. He just wasn't uh, 6'8", 240. But the, the team member that I, I knew the best was Brian Taylor. Brian was going to be an educator, as it was I, so we were in many of the same classes. My name is Brian Taylor, and I'm from Tell City, Indiana. I'm six foot five. I weigh 210 pounds. I'm a junior here at U of E, and I'm majoring in business education. Brian Taylor from Tell City was an outstanding player that had initially gone to Louisville. We were lucky to get him. Very good talent, fundamentally sound. I think Brian sticked out just because, uh, you know, he was a nice player, but I think he was just such a hard worker. The players that had been playing for A-Rad, they really fit very nicely into Bobby's uh, form of coaching. We had a lot of new things going, new coach, new staff, but I think the personalities of the guys and everything really came together, and Bobby, being the coach and the leader he was, was able to take, you know, the older ones and the young ones and fit them together, you know. of the scouting report with Coach Bobby Watson and the University of Evansville Purple Aces. Coach Watson, I'm certain the fans are going to be quite eager to hear what you have to say on your first scouting report. Looking forward to a very tough test against the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers. Yes, Joe, I'll tell you, it's going to be an exciting ball game. The Western Kentucky team is a, a very good basketball team. The Western Kentucky game was a tough one. We, we competed well. It was a pretty close contested game. We had the lead late till about five minutes to go, and then the wheels came on. We talked about it afterwards, and we talked about it being pretty much a maturity factor, not knowing how to finish out a game. I know from a coaching standpoint, it was uh, certainly was not a moral victory. You know, us coaches don't believe in that, but we saw something we could build on. To have somebody of Western Kentucky's ilk, because they went on to a Sweet 16 berth that year, I believe. So they were a pretty good ball team, have them and play them close. There's a lot of enthusiasm with that. Even in those first few games before the crash, we played some 
tremendous teams. Without question, the two best teams that we played were Indiana State and uh, with Larry Bird and uh, DePaul with Mark Aguirre, among other quality big time players. At that time, DePaul had been really, really good through all the years, you know, so that was a, a big, big step, taking on a big time opponent. And they beat us pretty good. We went up there. We were in the game the first half, but not second. The one that I really liked was when we played Pittsburgh. We had been on the road, and you know, it's always good to come home, but we had a pretty good idea of what we were coming home to. We were going to come home to a rambunctious crowd and a full house. So, you know, it was very, very exciting, you know, and the players were excited. And we performed well. You could see bits and pieces of confidence growing, both in themselves and the players, but also in themselves as a team. They beat Pittsburgh like 91 to 83 or something like that. When they played Pittsburgh and knocked off Pittsburgh, I said, they're starting to come together. It was a good win. The city went crazy. The balloons went up, believe me, they, they went up. People sensed we're on our way. The team was starting to gel with so many new faces, new coach, new coaching staff. You can imagine the struggles, but there was, there was a lot of feeling that the team had incredible potential. I remember uh, watching Bobby Watson leave the floor right there in front of the scorer's table, shook the coach's hand, walked off the floor, and I couldn't help but think, this is his first time. All he's worked for all of his life, he's wanted to be a Division I coach, and all of a sudden he has a victory. And I watched him walk off through the tunnel. We were going to leave on Tuesday to go down to, uh, to Middle Tennessee, and we had practiced, I guess it was uh, Monday, late and we didn't have a good practice. Finally, Bobby had had enough. Blew the whistle, he said, stop. He said, get off the floor, go. You'll have your itineraries this afternoon for tomorrow's trip. So basically, he threw him out of practice. He was a great actor also. Bobby probably already had everything accomplished he wanted to accomplish, but he wanted to make sure he kept their attention also, you know. <laughs> so they left. And we stood around and we talked. Bobby had told myself and the other two assistants early in the practice season, he said, I want you at the first four games. I also want you to be on the road recruiting uh, any time that it's worthwhile that you can do it. Bobby said, hey, since we're recruiting Jeff Jones, why don't you go to Owensboro to the sports center and watch them play and then drive down to Murfreesboro the next day and be there for the game. I had left that morning from Evansville and had flown to Florida on a combination recruiting and scouting trip. I always made a couple of trips with the team. And so I say, hey, about my time to go. Sports information director, Greg Knipping, says, you go. And I said, I wish you'd have told me 30 minutes ago, but I said, I've scheduled a meeting tonight here, and I have to be here. My partner and I, we owned a furniture store on the west side of Evansville. Bobby Watson come in and said he wanted Maureen and I to make the trip. My daughter was playing basketball up at North Gibson and I wanted to go up there and watch. She was a senior in high school. I said no. My partner in the store was killed in a plane crash. I remember him leaving that morning. I remember me standing at the door and him walking down the sidewalk. He just decorated an outside tree with Christmas lights. I was in kindergarten. I remember breakfast that morning. I remember wanting to go to the game. I remember him saying he was flying and I thought that was cool. Flying number one, going to watch the Aces number two was cool. My roommate thought I was getting on that airplane. We were a broadcast team of three, Marv Bates, of course, was our voice. Mark and I did color commentary. I was listed on the manifest and had the worst flu I've ever had. Marv came by in the morning and basically, hey, if you can make it, meant fine. If not, fine. I was only broadcasting the home games because as a female, um, if I traveled, we'd have another room. On December 13th, I got a call from Mark and he said, Laura, I just am so sick. I just can't go. And I said, well, Mark, I'll go. So I went over to talk to Thornton Patberg and said, listen, you know, Mark's sick. Marv needs a color person. I can be that person. Patberg said, well, Laura, I think it's a little too late for that. That day, I had flown in and out of Tri-State Aero uh, on a trip to an orthopedic uh, manufacturer. And on our way back into town, uh, it was a stormy, bad night. Um, and we came through the lobby as some of the aces were coming into the lobby to take their flight out. And so we crossed paths and, you know, we said, well, good luck. The plane was late because of weather. They couldn't get out of Indianapolis. They came down, landed at 710. 
they had they got 20, 24 people on board with luggage in seven minutes or so, and then they try to start taking off. A friend of mine, Patrick Alvey, we were watching planes take off and we saw the UV plane. It was odd because as it took off, rather than a smooth flight, it kind of did a little hop, and he made a comment about that. And then rather than just continue on out this way, we saw it immediately start banking around to the left side. I remember hearing the sound of an airplane going over my head, and it was so low that I recalled glancing over at the clock and thinking to myself, I should remember the time. My family and I were having dinner. Initially, we heard a, a noise and then saw the plane hit the ground when the flames came up. A flash fire where the whole sky just, it was just awful. My wife called 911. I ran back through the woods, not really sure where it was, but knew it was between the woods and the airport. I said, we need to get over there. I was an ex-Vietnam medic and they decided that uh, I could probably help. We could see something burning in the distance, went down a little ravine and saw one other person walking around. I was very cautious initially, then very slowly walked up to the crash to find that the fuselage was broken into two pieces. It was located just west of the railroad tracks on a plateau. The railroad tracks were depressed in that area, probably 10, 15 feet. I noticed initially that there were bodies scattered around the airplane. My initial thought was that we were dealing with a group of backpackers because they had things on their backs. I saw some things that actually appeared to be grave markers. I thought, could it have landed in a graveyard? Well, as I got closer, I realized it was it was seats. Their airline seats, they were, many of them were still strapped into their seats. Once I realized, you know, uh, what was going on, I tried to see if I could help anyone. Found um, one person who was still alive, barely. I uh, put my coat on him. Altogether, there were four individuals that we eventually located that uh, were still breathing at that point. We were able to keep airways on these four individuals for probably 30 minutes, what seemed like probably an hour was probably 20, 25 minutes before rescue personnel got there. We got a call that there was a plane crash. I'm not sure where it came from, but nobody knew where it was. We got a call that the um, mass casualty plan was being initiated at uh, Welburn. Even though I wasn't officially on call that night, I of course responded to that and the teams started gathering uh, at the hospital in anticipation. We sent the car out to check in the area. Mike Ford and I were partners. We worked on our side of Evansville. We were riding around. Quite frankly, at first when we got the call itself, we had no idea what it was. And we asked for uh, clarification, then we finally realized that it was an airplane crash. We didn't know what kind of plane went down, just that there was a plane crash. So as we're going, I'm expecting to see some sign of a wreck site from fire or something. I'm driving these roads and I just specifically remember a lady coming out and telling us that it was down over the hill. We started walking down like a little trail to the south and then we, we could see fires. One of the officers called in and he said he, he found some little patches of fire so then he told us where, what the area was, and then so we were able to tell the emergency fire department and the rescue people. I came up behind one of the Evansville City Fire Department pumpers, and they were, they seemed to be going somewhere on purpose. And I thought, well, I'll just go with them. Reporter Larry Smith is at the scene now to give us the details on what happened. Larry? David, it was a truly sad scene and a disastrous scene. Once we got to the other side of the ravine is where we could start seeing the, um, the debris and, and the uh, bodies of the victims. I just started uphill and I caught myself because there was a body laying at my feet. And I hollered at one of the firemen and he came back and checked and there was nothing they could do for this young man. And it was a young man I remember very distinctly took a couple of more steps and almost tripped over a basketball bag and it had the UE logo on it. And that stopped my heart. I mean, it just stopped because I knew, or at least I thought I knew what we had.
There was one uh, of the guys by the name of Greg Smith that was still alive. And then we found another guy alive. His name was John Ed Washington. One of the ball players, I believe his name was John Ed Washington, was still breathing. We loaded him onto the banner and carried it down towards the railroad tracks where it was a little bit drier, a little bit stable footing. And I stayed with him, tried to uh, help him breathe. His breathing was very heavy. It's, you could tell he was really struggling. And I stayed there and, and until uh, he passed away. Once the stretcher was on the scene, then we loaded Greg Smith onto the stretcher. It took about six of us to get him down to the railroad tracks, up from the railroad tracks, and then through the woods. Once we were past the railroad tracks, uh, it was fairly easy to get him out to where the waiting ambulance was. Then we went back, started looking for, for more survivors. I don't believe we that I found anybody else alive. We pretty much had discovered with all the people there that there were no more survivors. And then the final call came in that there would be no survivors uh, coming. So here we had um, an emergency room, a waiting room, and a hallway full of people ready to and wanting to respond, and there would be no response. Michael, we were talking earlier about the plane crash, and I know in this segment you're going to talk to somebody who was supposed to be on the plane, but fortunately didn't make the trip. That's right, uh, David. Uh, with me is Lawrence Miller of Miller Black Company, and uh, Lawrence, needless to say, you're, you're grateful, but boy, just an unbelievable night. How did it come about that you missed this fateful crash? Mike was over yesterday to practice. I was talking to the boys. The kids from North Carolina were interested. They were excited. They were going home for Christmas. And I asked uh, the coach, could I make the trip? He said, be glad to have you. I have a seat open. So Bob Hudson called me today about 10.30 this morning. I said, well, Bob, I don't, can't really go today. I'll be really glad to go tomorrow, but I had something I had to do today. Then I go out and play tennis to racket club, and I hear this thing, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Lawrence, we have received word uh, somewhat uh, encouraging. We have a confirmation of uh, the fact that uh, at least the school radio station is confirming that Mark Moulton of WVEC was not on the flight. Also, uh, the uh, assistant coaches for certain, uh, Ernie Simpson was not on the flight. Ernie was over scouting the Apollo uh, Owensboro game this evening. He is en route back to Evansville. We were sitting in the sports center in Owensboro. People that I had known over most for me to come down, the bleachers. And they said, we want you to watch this news on TV. Whenever I got word of this, I said, I need to go over. And I went to the gymnasium and Jim Byers was playing intramural basketball. We were playing pickup ball in the gym that night and Coach Myers was playing with us. And suddenly someone sprinted on the floor. I don't know who it was, right in the middle of the game. Went up to the coach and spoke into his ear and he ran off. That evening, I was expected to attend a recital on the U of E campus. It was the uh, Philharmonic String Quartet. Dr. Graves and Barbara Graves, uh, the president and his wife, were sitting right behind me in Wheeler Concert Hall. During the first half, Thornton Patberg came in and whispered something to Dr. Graves, and he hurriedly got up and walked out in the middle of a performance, which he never did. Thornton Patberg, who was vice president for student affairs, came up and asked me to come outside and told me that there was a rumor that uh, the uh, t plane carrying our team to Tennessee had crashed, and we weren't sure that was true yet. Roger, do you have any idea when we might be getting some official uh, uh, accounts uh, of uh, perhaps uh, who the victims are? We know that there was one survivor, and of course we're all waiting for that one, but uh, do you know when they might start uh, releasing some names? Mac was called to leave because he said there was one boy who's still alive. They thought that it was Smith, and of course he died before Mac even got there. They established a temporary morgue uh, in the uh, auditorium, the Civic Auditorium downtown. Earl Cox had set up for us to have the community center. It was kind of a central downtown location. It was near the railroad tracks, and it was a Vandenberg County property. As the crowds grew, talked about maybe trying to get the railroad, use the railroad tracks somehow to 
to get people out. It was the easiest way to remove all the remains uh, that we could that night from the scene. We got a hold of L and N and they sent an engine out there immediately. I can close my eyes and I can hear that rail car squeaking down those tracks. That'll never leave me. It was a morgue. It was gruesome. It was tearful. It, it, it was heartbreaking. Buyers identified bodies. I helped identify bodies. But we uh, were not allowed to contact or respond to parents who had also seen television all over the place and uh, were calling in. We wanted to notify them as soon as we could. But the coroner wouldn't let us do it because there was one body that was this happened to be the co-pilot that couldn't be identified. Therefore, they did not want to releasing until they were absolutely sure. Finally, uh, Byers and Graves and myself says, hey, that's not right. We've got to tell these people. We went back to my office about midnight, a few of uh, the representatives of the university and uh, called parents and notify them of the tragedy. I called every parent that night. They get the news and they'd get phone calls. It was on the news in other cities before it was even on news in Evansville. Keith called us. He didn't like to fly. He was afraid of flying. It was a DC-3, it was a real slow plane. And I wanted to sell him. Now I said, well, I said, it's a slow plane, Keith. You just get out and walk around for a while if you don't like the flight and get back in again, kidding around with him. Then I kept watching television and they suddenly broke in, said there was a crash at Evansville. And it struck me, there couldn't have been another plane at taking off at that time. I just, I just knew it was his plane. I had just walked in the door and the phone rang and it was a friend and I was talking to my friend and all of a sudden the operator broke in and she said, I have an emergency phone call for you and it was my sister-in-law. And she said, Bob's been in a plane crash. The whole team has been in a plane crash. There is one survivor. And I'm sure that it will not be Bob. She wanted to tell me so that I could call my mother before she heard it from anybody. So at that point, I called my mother. And just as I called her, across the bottom of the TV screen where my mother was, it came across. The kids, I tried to get them onto bed and there was a knock at the door and a bunch of his police buddies were there. And they said, we've been down at the morgue and we've identified him. And I said, I appreciate that, but I'm going to. Because I thought I needed to accept it that night that I could face the next day. I needed to know for sure. And then it seemed like all of a sudden we were getting the families. That was just one of the most sobering um, scenes you, you could imagine. It was just completely quiet here. And it was just because of what had happened and I think the respect and the sadness that just kind of draped over this place. I was there for a while and I went over to the campus. You know, I went, you know, I just kind of walked around and part of what I picked up right away was just this eerie sense of quiet. It was very quiet. Uh, there were a lot of people out and about, but uh, yeah, I think the biggest thing for me was the silence. I was a freshman at University of Evansville. I was working on the crew of uh, A Christmas Carol. During the performance, there was a few people saying, you know, at intermission, the stage manager wants to talk to everybody. And uh, she said that uh, a plane crash had happened. They didn't know all the details, but they thought that there were no survivors. And it was the University of Evansville basketball team was on there. The lead in the show at the time was Daryl Troutman, who had friends on that plane. And people had to go back out and sing Christmas carols and, you know, act jovial. And then Daryl had a, a scene where he had to talk to his son, which is Tiny Tim, at, at, at a grave. And um, I think all of us were kind of holding our breath to see how he was going to get through it. And I, I don't believe he made it all the way through it. I was moved to call uh, the university chaplain, Emerson Epps. And I said, uh, Emerson, I think we probably ought to have new chapel ready. 
And then students started to show up in chapel without any notice being given. And they sat in the pews, quiet, holding hands. Again, repeating, if you're joining us late, the tragic uh, news, the top story of the hour, of course, the plane taking the University of Evansville basketball team, 31 passengers en route down to Nashville tonight, where the, tomorrow night they were going to be playing the University of Middle Tennessee at Murfreesboro. The plane crashed east of uh, the airport. The kids, I tried to get them onto bed, and I remember uh, Mike coming on and them saying, uh, reading off the names, and Keith stood there and was saying the names. As the picture would flash before Mike could say it, Keith would say the name. Tony Winburn, a senior from Jeffersonville. Kevin Kingston, a senior from El Dorado. Steve Miller, a junior from New Albany. Likewise, Brian Taylor from Tell City was thought to be on it. Keith Moon, a sophomore, the kid they call the bird from Kettering, Ohio. The freshman, Craig Hackendorn from Cincinnati. Mike Joyner of Terre Haute. This is Barney Lewis of Goldsboro, North Carolina. Mark Siegel, a freshman. Likewise, Greg Smith. Mark, of course, was from Indianapolis. Greg from West Frankfort, Illinois. Mike Duff from El Dorado, Illinois. I talked to this young man's father about 15 minutes ago, Ray Commandella from Munster. Warren Alston, Silky, kid from Goldsboro, North Carolina. And of course, our main man, head coach Bobby Watson. This is a tragedy that defies description. We're all quite numb at this point. But we know that uh, the victims of this crash were all fine people, a great bunch of student basketball players and the coaches and their friends, and uh, the university will suffer their loss for the rest of its, uh, its life. I do not remember going home. I don't remember sleeping. I just remember getting up the next morning and my door looked out at the campus. It never again looked the same to me. One of the things I remember was how lonely the university administration building looked and the flag up there flying at half staff. People were not going into their offices. It was sort of a numb walking around, trying to sort of piece it together. And there was a, a memorial service at New Chapel, and I remember it just being jam-packed full of people. The next few days, the community was in shock. The public memorial service was at Roberts Stadium, right where this team played and Roberts Stadium was again packed. Large crowd, absolute silence. You could hear absolutely a pin drop. It was solemn, sad. And I remember the, the speech of President Graves. Out of the agony of this hour, we shall rise. Out of the ashes of a desiccated dream, we shall build a new basketball team, stronger, more valiant than ever before. That was the mission of our fallen brothers. Their dream will be fulfilled. Their supreme sacrifice will be vindicated. We paid for all the funerals, whatever they were. Uh, my wife and I and other officials attended all those funerals in about three or four days. I tried to get to as many of them as I could. Ultimately ended up in Pittsburgh for Bobby's funeral. Uh, flew to Cincinnati uh, for Craig Heckendorn's, and I flew back to North Carolina for Warren and Barney's uh, funeral services there. Stevenson returned to Evansville on Sunday night. 
five days after the plane crash, and the same day Evansville had publicly mourned their aces at Roberts Stadium. And then, tragedy struck again. This time finding the one team member who hadn't been on the plane to Murfreesboro, freshman statistician David Furr. David from Southern Illinois, we liked some things that he could do, didn't feel like he was quite ready to play at that level. And so Bobby said, we'll, we'll give you a spot on the team. We'll let you keep stats for us. You'll be part of the program. He had possibilities. He wasn't going to play a whole lot that year, but he had possibilities. David sprained his ankle badly. Uh, one of those sprains that they always say had been better off if it had been broken. So he wasn't able to travel with us. And we were going to take him because it was a flight that we had seats for. His brother was, I think, two years after. But then they got killed in the car wreck two weeks after the tragedy. You know, I guess about the only explanation we seemed like at that time we came up with was, you know, God wanted a truly first-class Division One team in heaven, and he needed the whole team. As the community mourned the loss of their beloved aces, 29 families struggled with an even more personal loss. The loss of husbands, fathers, brothers, and in so many cases, sons. From the moment of the crash, there were some bitter feelings. And I mean, I had some of those kind of looking for somebody to blame, you know, who took my brother away. It was very strong emotions from the parents which is justifiable. When you lose your son, the university should be taken care of. And decisions they made, and our son's not long, no longer with us. Uh, you know, maybe they didn't make the right decision. There were a lot of people so upset. There was finger pointing. Why did this happen? It's their fault. One of the players, uh, Keith Boone, his dad, he kind of got us all together. I just didn't feel like the attitude was, boy, we're so worried about your so we're so sorry about this. We got a hold of a very, very good aviation attorney firm. We contacted all the other people whose sons were on that plane. Then we arranged a meeting down in Evansville. We brought the attorneys in, they talked to us, and we decided to retain them. I was not involved in any of that. I was aware of it. I chose not to participate because I felt quite differently. Everyone handles grief in a different way. The lawsuits, uh, of course, never went to trial. They were all settled. We had a settlement. Yeah, it was settled out of court. I don't know, can't remember the details of it. We were not to, you know, divulge that. Frankly, there's no such thing as a settlement that even approaches the value of the life of your child, period. The lawsuits also failed to resolve the question of why. Why the plane had gone down. And why the 29 people on board had lost their lives in tragedy. Answering those questions fell to the National Transportation Safety Board, whose work began in the early morning hours of December 14th and continued through the better part of 1978. In the February following the accident, they conducted hearings here in Evansville. They were at the Executive Inn downtown. I didn't know what to expect. I was thinking that, you know, hey, they're going to come up with the answer. And after three days, there were no answers. There were more, there was just more confusion. You always want a magic bullet in that situation. Oh, well, yeah, somebody didn't fill a gas tank. When a plane crashes, typically five or six or seven things failed in sequence. And so it's inherently complicated to reconstruct what happened because you have to try and get those pieces and figure out what that sequence was. Officials who've been in Evansville this week investigating the crash will meet and they'll start compiling reports from Evansville, Indianapolis, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They'll also be getting reports in from other parts of the country where parts of the plane have been sent. But officials say a final determination on the flight path of the plane and the determination on the cause of the crash is not expected for several weeks. The probable cause announcement came in Washington, D.C. Part of the, uh, the issue was someone had placed uh, a control lock in a rudder and in a right aileron, and they did not get removed. The control lock's a little bit like my fingers. It, it uh, takes uh, the movable surface and simply makes it immovable. The control locks are extremely elemental. 
in flying the aircraft, they need to be off. We need to have controls absolutely free. The other issue uh, was uh, one of uh, baggage and loading and CG. They distributed the weight improperly. It was loaded into the uh, tail section instead of being put up in the in the middle of the plane as they manifest as said it would be. The aircraft, according to witnesses, had pitched up very high in a nose-high attitude and flown into what would uh, normally be described as an area of reverse command. This means that the nose gets so high that uh, the aircraft can't accelerate and you have to lower the nose. Well, if you're right at the edge of the cloud base or if you're only a few hundred feet off the ground, you don't have that space. If the pilot had had full access to the controls, he might have been able to recover. He couldn't turn the airplane, so people did report strange engine noises. And what's assumed is that the pilot was using alternating power to guide the airplane. It appears he tried to circle around using that alternating engine technique, and he finally just plane gave up. The plane uh, quit flying altogether and, uh, and crashed. I was glad to know what happened. It just made you more furious that stupid, by-the-book kinds of things would kill 29 people. There's got to be some anger there, I suppose. In fact, I know there is, but Keith would not want us to have vitriol and anger all the time. I've passed through that. It was a terrible accident, and, and that's what it was. No one wanted, wanted it to happen, and I, I, I don't blame the school or, or any of that. The obvious thing is that we'll be canceling the, the games, the immediate games that we have, and, and uh, we'll have to sit down and, and uh, assess our situation as far as what we'll, we'll do from the first of the year on. I do recall, the big question is, where does UE go from here? I think it took a while to think about the next season, but that was going to happen. We had to recruit a whole new bunch of players, get a new coaching staff. From uh, whatever, the middle of January until the uh, first part of March, we tried to maintain some type of semblance of recruiting, uh, still evaluating kids. Stafford kind of took the lead and organized where we might go and see players. Explained to them what was going on with the program and that uh, we still were interested, uh, but it was tough when you didn't know who your head coach was going to be. During this process, the search was open on a national basis for the, to replace Bobby. We did national advertising, the applications came in, and we started doing interview. They had six or eight that came to campus. They interviewed Ernie and me, and it basically was a decision that uh, was made that they hired Dick Walters. Dick had had great success and was coaching the number one ranked junior college team in the country at that time. Dick Walters was a tremendous dynamic person. He had this good looking uh, tan and, and uh, just, just a very, very outgoing person. He had carried with him a, an energy. It was almost like he could, in his seat, you know, he'd be sitting there and he would just like, he could couldn't sit still. He had an energy and a feeling about what he wanted to do there, why he was the right guy, great at selling himself. I really went after that job and I wanted it. I saw it as an opportunity to help people uh, recover, help the university recover. And I saw it as a great challenge because I, I knew you're literally starting from scratch. Well, it's one thing to build a new Division I team. Uh, it's another thing to build a Division I team after the first one you had has been so tragically killed. He was charged with moving us into Division I without sorrowing the team that almost was. How do you do that? I, I think he had a really difficult job. Everything you say, everything you say in public, everything you say about a game, everything you say to a recruit, everything you say to the media, you've got to be extra careful that, you, you know, even inadvertently you don't say something that could be read as cow. I remember I said something that, that I, I would have to this day loved to have back. And I said, I hope out of this terrible tragedy, we can find something positive to build on. And one of the parents called me, wanted to know how in the world I could hope we'd find something positive out of what had happened. And so one of my jobs is to, to make sure I, I did my very best to say the right things that were appropriate, but still move forward and make people believe that we were going to do something special. And we did. He basically got the job the first part of March, and he sat down with Ernie and, and Mark and myself, and uh, 
and we talked and he offered us positions on his staff. But Ernie went back to high school coaching. Mark went to Wake Forest and then I stayed with Dick for three more years. As soon as he agreed to stay on, Stevenson found himself back on the recruiting trail, a job that would consume Walter's entire staff for several months. Before the plane crash, we were looking to recruit big players. We needed size uh, in our front line. When we started recruiting to replace the team, we needed everything. So we just recruited talent. I really, my, my first couple years didn't worry about whether this guy was a point guard or this guy was a power forward. We just wanted quality athletes that could do the academic work, represent the university and the city, and win basketball games. NCAA gave us a dispensation that allowed us to accept transfers from a Division I school to us without sitting out. Normally, you have to sit out one year. So we recruited a mixture of four-year college transfers. We had good kids that transferred in from Iowa. There were three of us actually that came from Iowa, Jimmy Hallstrom, Larry Olsthorn, and myself. There was another transfer that came from Kansas, Scott Anderson, and then a fifth transfer from Arkansas, Mike Watley. Dick had brought a couple of his DuPage players with him, so we had junior college kids come in. Darnell McGee, Randy Okresic, and Steve Long were, I think, the three JC guys, and then the rest of the team was freshmen. I was one of several freshmen. Theron Bullock, Brad Leaf, Eric Harris, and myself were the first four freshmen that went through the whole four-year process to, and graduated. We were really young. Uh, we had no seniors. We probably had six juniors, and then the rest were freshmen and sophomores. As we came back into competitive mode, as we had gone through the same, a lot of the same things that we went through the year before, new team, new players, new coaching staff, putting things together was similar in a lot of ways. The early practice things that we did were very much oriented toward team kinds of things. The offense we were gonna run, the different defenses we were gonna run. They knew what they were stepping into when they came there. And I don't think for one minute they thought it was going to be easy. But the togetherness and the camaraderie and the friendship, that's why we got good. Watching them take the floor for the first time sent shivers up and down your spine. Bringing the, the new team, the first team out on the floor after all that had happened, I just remember electricity in the stands and on the floor. There was just this feeling, that, uh, the rising from the ashes kind of feeling that the whole town was behind this program. You felt even like you wanted to follow them even more after the plane crash because you wanted to do something. If we couldn't get to the games, we would... Uh... Even in the newsroom, uh, we would listen to him on the radio. I remember going to the very first game. Um, it, I, I remember it being a road game. I remember it being at SIU Carbondale. The first bucket, I think, was scored by Mike Watley. I, I don't know why I remember that. Everybody wanted, obviously, to, to do their best to perform and get a victory. We were not able to get a victory that, that first time. I think we started out 0-5. Started to wonder if we were going to beat anybody. At that point in time, we were on such a steep learning curve, just, you know, having started from scratch. We won our first game, I think it was down at Murray State. Darnell McGee hit a jumper, I'll never forget it. And it was like a load was taken off of our shoulders. I totally lost it. I'm, my pitch and my voice must have gone to octaves that only could have been replicated if I was being tortured. But it was such a relief, I just, I don't know how many times I said aces win at an octave level that only dogs could hear. It was just such a relief. That kind of got the monkey off our shoulders at that time. We could relax a little bit more. And they seemed to come, you know, easier after that. We ended up that first season, 13 and 16. I think all things considered, it went really well. We ended up a pretty successful season. It wasn't 500, but, but given where we started, I think we achieved some things. Even if we didn't win a game, I think that season was a success. Even to this day, I'm not a big basketball fan, but what I loved at the time was not so much people dribbling back and forth on the court. What I loved were the people in the stands. It was a rebuilding process that 
was important, but it, it was not done overnight. Every year was a little bit better than the previous year. We finally had a senior class the second year, and again, I think we were uh, getting more successful, won a few more games. I think we ended up being 18 and 10 my senior year, that second year. My junior year, we started to run with the ball. Coach recognized the talent with the athletes that we had and the skill sets that we had. Our senior year, I knew we could be good, and then things just really started to click. What I remember about them is how dominant that team was. They were a special team. You know, I was only 10, but they were exciting and they won. Theron Bullock was a great team leader and he was our go-to man, Brad Leaf. He was our leading scorer. He's just tough to stop. He could post up a smaller guard down low. He could shoot the lights out up front. We were able to execute defense and shut down other players. I mean, we took Kansas to overtime at Kansas that year. We were getting some mention in the top 20s and some polls, 21st, 22nd. I can remember Brent, Brent Musburger saying at CBS, there's a wonderful story developing in Evansville, Indiana. The Aces are coming back. And then running through the Midwestern Cities Conference, run through the postseason tournament. We were in the conference with Butler, Detroit, Xavier, Oral Roberts, Oklahoma City. Coming down the stretch, I believe the championship game was against Loyola. We weren't going to get into the NCAA tournament. 23 and 6 with our schedule, we were not going to get in. We had to win that game, and we knew that. And uh, with about three, four minutes to go, we were up by enough points. It just started to hit home then that we knew this was starting to happen. I remember, you know, looking up at the clock with a few seconds left, and it just hit me that we actually got in the NCAA tournament. To see that basketball team go to that NCAA tournament for the first time, was of course delightful. Evansville, I think, was waiting for that moment. Everybody's now talking about the Aces playing basketball in a tournament. I mean, it was common conversation. It was in boardrooms, it was in bathrooms, it was in any room you want to be in. People were excited. The university and the fans would never forget what happened, but they had to move on, and that team helped us move on. I remember coming back on the plane. We were in Tulsa, flew back through Atlanta, and landed at, uh, at Evansville. And I never will forget, we, we had thousands to greet us. The city basically turned out at the airport. I remember it very well. We were getting off the plane, and before the doors opened, the pilot got on the PA system and says, you got up to 5,000 people waiting for you to step off this plane. Congratulations and good luck. Out of the agony of this hour, we shall rise. Out of the ashes of a desiccated dream, we shall build a new basketball team, stronger, more valiant than ever before. That was the mission of our fallen brothers. Their dream will be fulfilled. Their supreme sacrifice will be vindicated. Bless them with us. 
Cause if you tell 